Hey, good evening, A-Push Nation. Welcome in where tonight we're going to focus on uh, some of the social effects of, of the ec economics uh, that we're developing in the colonies. Uh, in class, we're going to, tomorrow, we're going to obviously have a reading quiz, and that reading quiz is based solely on a lot of what I'm going to talk about. But you'll find a lot of information in the textbook uh, somewhere around chapter, the end of chapter three, beginning of chapter four. So if you want to brush up on that, um, on the on, on what we're saying tonight in the textbook, that's where you can go. End of three and uh, beginning of chapter four. Uh, the focal point in class after we take the quiz is going to be on the economy's uh, development in the um, in the, each of the colonies, the regions we've been discussing: New England, the Middle Colonies, and the Southern Colonies slash Chesapeake. So I'm going to really focus in on social effects within each of those regions, and we'll start with the South. Uh, as we painted the picture here in class the last couple of days, the southern economies, which again included the Chesapeake region, really focused very heavily on uh, the plantation economy. The idea that, that these large farms were going to be supporting um, the industry and the economies of the south, uh, particularly we already talked about the importance of tobacco, um, but we're going to be looking more at some of the key cash crops in the south uh, tomorrow in class. And when it, when it comes to uh, the southern social life um, due to the economy, very interesting that the patterns of development there mirror what is going on in England in a lot of ways. If you remember from Euro last year, England was, was, was set up in a society where wealthy elites maintained the majority of the land. In fact, in the early 1700s, roughly about 75% of all of England's land was owned by the upper class. So that creates, um, and the term that, that we're going to use throughout this discussion today and moving forward, um, the term I want you guys to really make sure we get down is that, that, that when we talk about colonial elites, you know, the wealthy landowner people, the class of people, we're going to refer to them as the gentry, G-E-N-T-R-Y, the gentry. And, and the, 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 gentry, the gentry class is best typified in the South because of the large plantation um, land that, that the wealthy elites had owned. And, and again, this goes back to the precedence for this started in Jamestown with the, with the tobacco farming. Um, and it grew as the colonies grew into Maryland and the Carolinas and uh, eventually Georgia. So in the South, because of the plantation economies, you have a very dominant gentry class, meaning people sort of that came to, to the southern colonies really resonate, uh, resonated a lot of the values and the, the, not only the, the, the values of the economy, but social values that were prominent in England. So you, get, you tended to have a very unequal distribution of wealth in the southern colonies. And that remains a key theme moving forward uh, into the 1700s. You also, of course, in the south, along with having the very gentry-dominated societies, you also have of course, slavery. And, and as slavery has come to replace indentured servitude in the South, that, of course, creates an interesting social dynamic in which slaves uh, maintain the majority of jobs uh, on the plantations. And, of course, we've covered this today in class. So you have very uh, unequal distribution of social uh, hierarchy, social um, mobility in the South, mainly because the gentry class um, so heavily dominated land ownership and the economies. Now, as we work our way north into the middle colonies, remember the middle colonies tend to be colonies such as Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Delaware. Um, those were our big middle colonies. And in the middle colonies, it's actually somewhat similar to the South in that the gentry class in the middle colonies really dominated heavily land ownership. But in the middle colonies, because they were not, the climate was different, that, you know, they didn't have the, the humid, um, swampy climates that, that grew tobacco and some of the cash crops, like rice, for example, that was really prominent in the South. Uh, the middle colonies were actually the breadbasket of the colonies. They were the breadbasket of the colonies, meaning they grew a lot of products like wheat and barley and grains, you know, very nutritious uh, crops that, that grew and, were, and could be turned into to food. So as a result of the middle colonies um, being the breadbasket, 
there was less a demand for, for forced shadow slavery like there was in the South because they didn't have these large farms uh, to, to run. And so what the gentry class ran, ran themselves into a bit of a problem, though, was that there was still a, a need for labor. You have farms that are supposed to be producing um, sustainable goods for foods, so you need people to work them. And the gentry class certainly wasn't going to work them. So what, what, the, what the gentry start to do in the middle colonies is develop a system known as tenant farm farming. Tenant, as in, you know, you're a tenant of um, an apartment. You rent an apartment. You're a tenant. It's the same idea in the middle colonies. Many of the middle colonies turned um, to tenant farming, meaning that people rented land uh, from the gentry. And then the idea was that you would work the land, you would harvest the land, and if the, the, the crops yielded a good return, perhaps you would be someday um, you'd be someday given the idea that you could eventually you know, buy your own parcel of land. And so tenant farming was a really uh, unique system that developed uh, primarily in the middle colonies. You don't see tenant farming really take off anywhere else. And, and, and if you think about it, you know, this is going to create a unique social dynamic. Uh, with, with the tenant farming being so prominent in, in the middle colonies, what starts to happen is a lot of European immigrants outside of the English colonies, uh, I'm sorry, outside of England, all began t to really uh, come in and as a result of tenant farming, the middle colonies were very attractive to foreigners such as um, the Scots and Irish and Germans. Uh, these are three main groups that, that emigrated into the middle colonies. So you have Germans, Scots, Irish, and a lot of these people were coming to the middle colonies be to take advantage of tenant farming opportunities. Now, let's just make no mistake, tenant farming was not some lucrative profession uh, that, that you maintained, but certainly it, it was a way for people uh, to, to, to come to the colonies uh, for, you know, for, for many reasons, of course. The religious you know, freedom concept, especially in Pennsylvania, of course, uh, where we know William Penn guaranteed religious freedom, uh, that was attractive to many of these German, Scottish, Irish immigrants. But the idea that you could work the land and that you have the opportunity to eventually buy the land, uh, maybe, you know, through your own profits, was very enticing to a lot of people. But I want to make a clear distinction here with, with the middle colonies and their social development. Despite the fact that the middle colonies were made up of, of English and, of course, a lot of Dutch. Remember, the Dutch you know, settled there uh, primarily in the first, you know, the first uh, part of the European colonization. With the introduction of a lot of Germans and Irish and Scots in the 1700s, the middle colonies did not become a melting pot. They maintained, for the, for the most part, their European identities. And, and that's, I'm sorry, I got to show you guys this. Look at, look at Homer. Homer, you want to say hi? Sorry, I, 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 I hope you guys could see him over there. Homer, say hi. Yeah, Homer uh, wanted, likes to say hi once in a while. So there, there, there's a little break in the action. Uh, but anyways, point being, the middle colonies were not a melting pot. People stuck to their European cultures, their languages, their specific Protestant religions in many cases. Um, and so despite the fact you have all these different mixtures of peoples in the middle colonies, you don't quite get uh, an infusion of this new sort of culture. You, people kind of stuck to their own ways. Oh, there, there's money. And then they're both going to come in here. So the last geog geographical section we have left to talk about is New England. And uh, specifically in New England, you know, we're going to focus on their, um, their economies tomorrow in class. Keep in mind what we already know about New England, uh, the, the religious importance in, in society, uh, both in, 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 in the way people deal with one another and, of course, in the way the governments work, but also um, the freehold system. The freehold system, which, which was a big selling point to a lot of the Puritans that migrated to the, uh, to the New England colonies, in the 1700s, that system began to be challenged basically because a lot of people uh, were running out of land. There just wasn't enough land to go around, and a lot of the freeholds, that ideal of owning your own land, was starting to dwindle. And one of the central issues around land ownership with the freehold system that put it in challenge was the matter of inheritance. Land would be passed down through inheritance, um, you know, from, 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 from father to son. And I say that specifically because women could not own land whatsoever. Uh, this, was, this was true in most of the colonies, but it was especially uh, true in the New England colonies. And speaking of women and their roles in the colonies, I'm going to bring Misha, another one of my teaching assistants, in. And Misha is going to give you guys a little breakdown 
of how women were perceived, especially in the New England colonies. So Misha, take it away. This is Misha, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about gender inequality in the colonies. Um, but before we get into that, it's really important to understand the importance of family uh, in the colonies. So family was really the backbone of colonial life because it was the backbone of every colonial institution, whether it be government, church, or the community. And firmly established gender roles, um, specifically firmly established roles given to each member of the family, really helped to maintain strong family structures, which in turn kept the colony alive almost. Um, and women had really subservient roles in the American colonial family, which meant that they consequently had subservient roles in American colonial life. Um, they were always under uh, the control of men, at, depending on each stage of life that they were in. So let's say that I um, lived in the colonial era. Um, right now, because I'm unmarried, I would be under the control of my father, um, and I'd be under his jurisdiction, effectively. Um, and I would have some rights at that point. I can make a will, buy or sell property, and um, I can sue or be sued. Um, but as soon as I get married, which usually for Puritan girls, they wanted to get married by the age of 20 due to social pressures, um, they were they had very, very few rights. Um, they were completely subordinate to their husbands, and basically their entire purpose of life was to make their husbands happy and to have good, nice, religious kids. Um, so when a colonial woman got married, her legal identity disappeared. Any property that she owned gets transferred to the husband, um, whether it be like, um, not, not just property, any um, goods, livestock, money, any of that get, um, now belongs to the husband. Uh, any kids um, that, they, that she gives birth to belong to, um, the custody of those children gets given to the husband rather than to her. And um, she had very few rights. Uh, she could not make a will without the explicit consent of her husband. Uh, she could not buy property. She could not make a contract. And she cannot sue or be sued um, in court. So let's say I'm not happy with this. I think this is really terrible. Um, so as um, a hypothetical colonial woman, I get rid of my husband somehow. He dies. Either like I kill him or something, or he dies of natural causes. Um, and now I'm a widow. And widows really uh, have more rights than both married women, definitely, and unmarried women. Um, they have all the rights of unmarried women, except a couple more, so they can take custody of their children. And they also have the right to own um, to their husband's property. Um, so if they didn't have kids, then she gets half of her husband's property. And if they did have kids, then some of that property would go to the kids, obviously. So she only gets a third of her property, but she still um, gets to reclaim her husband's property. Um, if a woman didn't want to um, be subservient to men and be under their control all the time um, through the various stages of her life, then um, if she were to try to rebel, she was quickly um, admonished by society. So either she was shunned by her community or in extreme cases, like um, legal action could be taken against her, like how um, Anne Hutchinson was exiled to Rhode Island or during the Salem witch trials when outspoken women uh, were hanged. Um, as witches. So there is one quick exception to this rule. The Quakers um, allowed for more religious freedom than the other colonies did in that um, women were allowed to participate um, in church services. Though the services were segregated based on gender, so they'd have one service for the men and then another service for the women and they did not intermix, um, they were allowed to partake in church more than, let's say, the New England or um, women in the New England colonies were able to. So as a quick recap, um, if you were a woman in the uh, American colonial era, your life was not very fun. Uh, you did not have many legal rights and you were basically under the control of either your father or your brother or your husband. And um, particularly in the case of a married woman, your entire goal in life was just to make your husband happy and your own literal existence was just secondary to that. Um, so I think we should all be happy, especially if you're a girl, that you're living in modern time periods rather than the colonial era. So uh, back to you, Mr. Smith. Okay, thanks, Misha. Uh, I appreciate you doing that. And uh, we're going to take a look at a primary source tomorrow that really exemplifies uh, the role of women in the colonies. And this will be right after the quiz. And then we'll get into the, in, into the economies. So where this all comes together is ultimately we have to learn how these social differences in the colonies is going to really rear up again when we start talking about moving towards independence. 
we've noted how each th of the three regions were all uniquely different, not just in lang not just in not just in terms of religion. I mean, I know you guys like to focus on the religion part, but just keep in mind the social differences of these these colonies, which ties directly to the economies, plays a significant role in how they're going to eventually try to come together, and that's going to present some challenges that we, we talk about later on down the line. So keep this sort of fireside chat in mind for future references. Focus on those, those terms, those, the, uh, the, uh, the big concepts for the quiz tomorrow, and I have no doubt we'll get this thing turned around uh, after, after the test last week, which was pretty tough for some of you guys. So uh, I'll look forward to seeing how we, we do on the reading quiz tomorrow. We've got the economies to hit. And then uh, we'll be off to Friday already. So thanks for listening. Have a good evening. Remember, the past shapes the future.